Welcome everyone uh, to Scalapeno. I'm really glad to be here. And yeah, you on purpose don't see anything on this screen because that's what the talk is about. Um, it was stuff we don't see. Um, but actually, if you look really hard, there's something there. And in this case, um, yeah, still can't see the other stuff, but it's a um, brightness adjustment screen from some game. So. Uh, who am I? I'm Conrad, uh, as introduced by Tomer. I run uh, the Geekon conference and I'm also part of the Java 1 program committee and do a bunch of random stuff in Krakow, so community work, as in um, yeah, Scala user group and software craftsmanship groups. Uh, but most importantly, I think, uh, for me at least, I'm part of the Akka team and currently maintaining Akka HTTP, uh, but not only. So, um, has anyone not heard of Akka here? Now we have a few people who have not heard of Akka. So Akka is um, basically a building block, a toolkit for distributed and concurrent applications. But the, the talk is not really about it. However, we will touch a bunch of topics. So we're going to talk about a bit of software in general, um, then a bit of Scala and a bit of Akka, but all in the context of the things we don't see. And you, you will see in a minute what I mean by that. So, the things we don't see in software. So, what do I mean by that? Um, so, there's this tension between the reality, what actually the computer runs, and you know, magical things that magically solve our problems. And we are always kind of keen to yeah, assume that the magic will you know, do the job for us, and we go towards it. And then it turns out that it's actually trying you know, to trick us, or that, well, once it doesn't work as we thought it does, we're not really able to either debug it or understand it. So, uh, one of the messages I'm trying to give during this talk is that uh, maybe not as much magic, and this is actually one of the philosophies we have in the Akka team, that being explicit about things is actually helping, right? Whereas some other tools or frameworks would be, we magically do it for you, right? So. At the core of it, the talk is about um, different trade-offs. But what, what is a trade-off, really? So, for example, um, measuring systems, right? Of course, um, what we can't measure, we can't improve yet. More often than not, I see people um, claiming they do something for the sake of performance without actually measuring if they met their SLA or if they even have an SLA or, you know, without actually looking into, did I improve or not improve the thing I was optimizing? So, and I myself recently um, was really tempted to, we have this parser and like HTTP, and I thought, yeah, but everyone knows the RADQ should be faster. So I rewrite it to the RADQ, and well, it turns out, it, well, it wasn't faster. So, um, what I'm trying to get across is that uh, without measuring, we're flying blind, and it's a thing we don't see unless you really want to focus on it and take a step back, measure, and then improve. So, and sometimes you get people, like angry people on the internet, there's plenty, of course, but uh, messages, uh, for example, on the mailing list would be like, oh my god, I changed all the settings to more, and it's not improving. A typical example, so um, um, here I have angry people on the slides, but uh, I'm going to give you like, real examples. So a real example here is uh, someone trying to have a thread pool of 600 threads, because yeah, more threads is probably more concurrent. Well, but I mean, the 600 threads still need to run on the four or however more many uh, cores you have, right? So more is not necessarily better. So. Whenever you have a situation like that, or I have, and I answer on the mailing list, okay, yeah, weird. Uh, so where's the bottleneck, right? So now you know you guys should be looking at where's the bottleneck and then we can optimize, not the other way around. And sadly, uh, more often than not, the answer we get on the mailing list is <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so please don't be that guy, okay? So measure, 
don't be that guy. And uh, the other way we sometimes see people is um, like, oh my god, that library is a hundred thousand times faster at serving a file, right, for example. So I'm going to use that a hundred billion times faster library to do my blog, right? Okay, so the thing is, um, this is specifically about benchmarks. That benchmark, for example, how fast can you serve a static file from a web server? And people compare a you know, Linux kernel bypass implementation that basically you know, can't get faster than that. It's serving a file from, from user space. And they compare that with a fully blown library or framework that actually does routing and um, you know, it does more. So it's not a fair comparison. So the point I want to stress here is that you, you need to compare apples with apples, right? If you're comparing a web framework-like thing, compare it with a web framework-like thing, and don't just assume that, look at the benchmark without any context what it's actually doing, and just assume, let's pick the highest one. Um, the context here is, um, Akash TDP will never be on the absolute top of such benchmarks, and that's okay, and that's the purpose, because we're doing different stuff. We're doing streaming things, and we're not doing raw bypassing the kernel serving a file. So, the other point about just software is that sometimes, um, again, about this flying blind thing, you have a production system and it's this cloudy thing, you don't really know what it's doing. I do hope, I mean, on production nowadays, everybody measures at least something, at least for health or at least for latencies, right? Anybody uh, measuring the mean uh, latency of their services? Yes? Yes? Are you asleep? Okay, hands went down, so that's good. Um, so yeah, usually we measure, what do we measure? Well, we measure the operating system, if it's healthy or not, so CPU load, memory load, stuff like that. Then we go um, into user land and we start measuring, for example, is the JVM GCing like crazy? Then perhaps we need to optimize in that area. Uh, and yeah, memory. And then of course we start measuring things about the application itself. So on the left-hand side, uh, the OK check, so no one really knows if your service is OK other than the service, if it can do some nice health check and an external system can ask it periodically, yeah, are you healthy or not? But also, uh, what is getting more and more popular and I think is really important, um, some more related to the actual thing that the service is performing metrics, right? Because healthy, yes, no is a good answer, but Sometimes you probably want to see um, a small scale st statistics about a service, like how many things is it doing, is it, is it doing okay or not, how many failures is it <laughs> having from its downstreams. So I do encourage you, if you're not there yet, to expose uh, user land metrics about the apps you're building. So systems, um, well, a system rarely comes alone, so you have these things between systems and the interesting thing about um, well, this um, broader scale here is, um, well, of course, the things between them, right? If you just see a bunch of red lines communicating between another, yeah, this doesn't tell me much. I just see they communicate, but um, we want to go into tracing, right? So this is something we... Um, don't really have a absolute solution for. For, for metrics and um, monitoring we kind of have, but the tracing solutions are not quite there yet, I think. And of course, there's things like um, a Zipkin, uh, which is the impl implementation of the Depper paper, so that's been around for a number of years, but I think this is only the beginning of the journey. And yeah, this is something we'll definitely be looking into to support more, and I'm really happy to talk about these things. But it, this is a Scala conference, I should probably talk about Scala and more nitty-gritty details, because in, in this context I want to talk about the things you, I mean, you write some code, but you probably don't realize um, what um, internal impact it has sometimes. So, the things we don't see in Scala. Uh, let's start with the obvious ones. Um, so, nulls. Nulls. As uh, Sir Har said, uh, the billion dollar mistake. And sadly, we have to live with it, right? For JVM has a concept of the null. So even if Scala is a functional language, we can't really get away from nulls because what does this code do? And here's a few tips it returns four, it does a null pointer, it 
could, right? We're on the JVM. Or it doesn't system exit. <laughs> so, um, well, obviously, we would assume the first answer. One would hope, right? Uh, if we're really negative, I mean, theoretically, at any point in time we call anything, there could be null pointers, but let's assume not. But the third point, um, I kind of both love and hate this answer, because it's, uh, at one as uh, spectrum of, uh, of the answer is, it's silly, right? No one does a summing method that suddenly system exits. However, the great uh, thing this answer uh, kind of tries to mm, um, expose is we don't really have super strong guarantees about will this actually execute, right? So things like transactions and we think, oh yeah, we need to slap transactions everywhere. And I would argue instead of doing transactions, if we do systems based on events and replayability, we don't care about any of these cases because we can always retry um, with a maybe fixed system where we fixed the null pointer or the system crash. Um, and that was something interesting to research, actually. So I looked into, okay, so when did uh, Scala get options? Uh, so it turns out that it get a uh, good option, uh, the class, in its current version at least, around 2007. So in Scala 2.5. Uh, Guava, actually, so the popular Java library by Google that um, also at some point started including optional, came quite later. So. Mm, 2011, and then finally Java caught up and has the same thing since Java 8, right? Um, but that's um, not really about the, it's not really about a history lesson here. It is about a specific thing that we all seem to have gotten wrong. So, yeah, this is a normal Scala option from the standard library. Uh, this is the one from uh, Guava. And we all seem to have the same mistake, right? Um, so, of course, we know that um, you get an optional, you map over it, right? Good old Scala code, um, you just for each over it, and you don't have the uh, opportunity to do the wrong thing, right? So, this is a good way. I mean, the for each and the map is both good. And then we have this w funny cultural cl clash of if for many years you've been a Java person and you're used to guarding uh, some code with an if, uh, then you basically take your null checking code, translate it to the optional checking code, and then you get this. Uh, well, the problem is um, now you have two places which kind of assume the non-empty, uh, well, not. Um, there is this one place which, is, which assumes non-emptiness, however, it's not one operation, right? Because with the map and with the for each, it's exactly one operation. However, now we have split the thing into two lines and it becomes actually more complex, even if you don't, don't realize. Uh, the interesting bit about Scala is even the check if empty and then do something pattern, thanks to, uh, to pattern matching, it's still the same operation. You can't really do it as wrong as you can do here because a randomly inverted condition. So I think pattern matching is actually something uh, very powerful, even in the simplest cases. Um, so the thing I wanted to say here is that even that um, we are so functional and stuff, we do have the get method, and the get method can throw, right? So we can still do the wrong thing. Can we do better than that? So what the eyes don't see, the programmer does not invoke. Uh, this brings us to futures. So. One could argue that blocking is the new, you broke the build, right? If someone blocks the event loop, everybody pays the price, the service is basically slowly grinding to a halt. Um, so just a quick summary of what I mean by blocking. So let's say you have two processors and you have two either actors or threads, doesn't really matter, and they do something on, on some kind of messages, and when you use up that thread by waiting on an I.O. write or on a database call, that thread is basically rendered useless because you're waiting on this I.O. operation instead of giving it to another one. So we really don't want blocking in reactive applications. Um, here's an example of someone asked this question on Stack Overflow and they did a sample application in which they um, have an HTTP uh, root and yeah, post complete with a future and sleep inside there. So the thing is, um, this will be using the default uh, system dispatcher 
which is shared across, you know, it's the default one. Everybody uses it unless they specifically use a different one. So what this uh, causes the application to do is, um, basically, this is sleeping, and this is the threads waiting, and this is the application actually doing something, right? Uh, I would prefer my application to do more than just sleep, right? So the problem here is blocking, right? The, f the sleep is just one example. Another example would be a file access or a very long running operation. So let's look at how futures deal with that. And let's see the Java one. So Java one, uh, it has a future, it has a completion stage, and the, the completable future, so Java 8 stuff, extends this one. And here's the bad guy. That's a get that will wait indefinitely for the value to come back, right? It's a blocking operation. Really bad. Don't touch that one. Uh, however, it also has a good version. Uh, the good version, well, the better version, I wouldn't say good. The better version at least has a timeout, right? So we wait a few milliseconds. If, it, if we didn't have the value, uh, then we just return. So I'm curious if anyone remembers the days before the Scala future. Hands up. Not that many. So I don't know if you realize, but there was a point in time in Scala where uh, the standard library didn't have a future. But because it's so inherent to uh, reactive programming, basically everybody had their own. So there was like five future implementations. Uh, one in Lyft, one in Akka, the Twitter guys had one. And yeah, it, it was a bit messy. But this was fixed uh, quite a long time ago, in 2012, when everybody came together. And now we have a Scala concurrent future. So. Uh, the reason the Java completable future has the get method, which I complained about, that's so horrible and blocking, is that they valued um, fitting into the existing APIs, right? So the normal future in, in Java was always blocking, and they wanted to fit into that interface. However, in Scala, we didn't have a future in the standard library before, so we had a clean slate. We could do something better because we're starting fresh. So. There is no get on the Scala future. You cannot just indefinitely wait on something. So great, we, we made it impossible to do the wrong thing. However, it, it kind of, maybe sometimes you need to because it's in a test and you don't care about concurrency in that case, exa uh, for example. So what we did is the, the bad thing is made harder to discover. It, it's made more inconvenient. So in order to await in a blocking way, um, for one thing, there always has to be a timeout, right? And for another thing, so there's always a timeout. And for another thing, it's put into a separate object, right? So it's not as easy to find a, a, the blocking operations on future, because there are no blocking operations on future. All the blocking is on the await. Um, so it's one of the invisible things that we sometimes don't think about is the, the setting in which decisions were made, right? So the Java guys uh, had to value the, the fitting into the existing types. And on the Scala side, we were luckier because we came late to the party in that sense. But thanks to that, we were able to have a nicer type. OK. So far, so good. Let's talk about random hidden features. I mean, um, I wouldn't call it an Easter egg, but certainly something that uh, not many people realize. So, um, I mean, everybody writes some form of Scala doc. Not much, uh, sometimes in internal libraries, but in external libraries, you want it to be as good as possible, right? And sometimes we ha uh, have interfaces, like in HTTP, uh, this is the directive straight, and it extends, well, all of these straights, which is 13 or so. Uh, so the reason is um, because we want our users um, to just import the directives and not really care about what exactly it comes with. I just want the directives. Um, and this means that basically the value members, suddenly we have um, 150 methods all in, in one section of the documentation. So it turns out there's a Scala doc feature about this, which is called groups. And we can make that better by grouping them together on a um, named basis. So we can put all the cache condition directives together. We can put all the debugging directives together. And the, the silly thing about it is that it's super easy. I mean, you just say group name, and then you group things to methods to the given group. 
and Scholardog does the thing for you. But the silly thing is that no one really knew about this feature unless they would read the source code of Scholardog, which no one really did for the last years, and then we found out. So um, this is a bad example of what I would uh, encourage you guys not to allow, which is if there is a feature, but it's not documented, it could possibly not even exist at all because no one will find it. And, and this is something we do in ACA that um, if there is a feature, it just can't not have documentation because then no one will find it, no one will use it. So documentation is as important as a code because as you can see in ScalaDoc, no one knew about this feature for a long time because it wasn't documented. So uh, a bit more low level stuff finally. So trait representation. So we all know what traits are. So traits allow us to do multiple inheritance in Scala. And um, here's a silly example. So I have a trait T, uh, two classes extending it, and it has this foo method. Right? So how is this represented on the JVM? At least in 2.11. So the silly thing here is that, well, we do something that Java doesn't do, so we need to model it in a way that the JVM can understand, but we are strictly more powerful than, than what is inherently supported by the JVM. So in Scala 2.11, what's happening is each trait is compiled down to a, um, well, a companion class, one might say, with a Dora at the end. It's uh, accessible via the module thing if, that you sometimes may see. And it actually contains the implementation of the method, right? Because here we can see uh, the trait has the implementation, right? It returns bar. So the implementation would be in the companion here. And then we have an interface that basically everyone who extends that trait, they implement the interface and the Scala compiler in each of the classes generates basically calls to the static methods, right? So it just does the mm, delegation manually, kind of. Now the problem with that is if we add a new method to the trait, for example, let's say this is a library and mm, some library author decided to add a method to the trait and we've been extending it, well, now we are missing that delegation code, right? Because the Scala compiler was doing it for us, it's not a runtime thing, it's a compile time thing, so suddenly it breaks. Um, so this is just the actual um, Java P output for these, so we get both the class and the interface. So what Scala 2.12 does, and it's coming out really soon now, is because since Java um, 7 we have uh, um, invoke dynamic, and since 8 we have the default methods and interfaces, and suddenly the semantics that Scala always had are easier representable in the native kind of uh, way. So now we don't generate the uh, interface anymore, so we just get exactly one class that has um, so it's an interface, and it has a method with a body, right? Which is basically what a, a trait is. So the interesting bit is sometimes people think that this will improve performance. Um, because people think, yeah, Java 8, Invoke Dynamic, it will improve Scala performance. Turns out it doesn't really matter for performance at all. However, it matters a lot for binary compatibility. Because now a library can add new methods to traits in a compatible way. Why do you care? Well, because it's easier to keep following the latest and greatest library and it gives more uh, freedom to library authors to evolve the libraries. But let's talk about um, ACO, as I learned. Uh, uh, Sadly, I didn't have the time to go over, but this looks really interesting, so maybe we can talk about the Queen of Lapronia instead, which um, perhaps you know is what ACA stands for. So it's the name of the uh, highest mountain in Sweden. But back to the topic. So um, if you've seen ACA at all, you would know that it's mostly about messaging, right? But it's not just a like a messaging service. It's really all about the messages and the actors interacting to each, which, with each other via messaging. So 
In one sentence, I pitched that already. It's a distributed and concurrent uh, toolkit. However, ACA actor, so the, the prime and main module of uh, ACA toolkit, is all about messaging and the differences to other libraries, maybe, that messaging is a core abstraction and it's not something that we add because, okay, now we need scalability, let's slap messaging on it. So, why is this important? So, LMK98 here. Uh, so, basically, the person who coined the term uh, object oriented programming software. And this is a wonderful quote. Um, you can read the entire thing. I will just read the uh, blue part. So, he coins the term object oriented software at uh, the Uppsala conference. And in one of the emails, he's sorry that for coining the term objects because it focuses, makes people focus on the objects and not about the core idea, which in his, uh, uh, his um, mind was the messaging. So it's entities communicating to one another via messages. That's how Smalltalk operates. And here's another one because, I mean, messaging and basically distributed systems have been around for quite a, while, quite a long time. But um, that's a wonderful paper by Waldo et al., um, Sun 94, in which they basically look into what they've done with NFS, which is remote procedure code based, and they realize that objects are in distributed systems are so inherently different than the local ones because suddenly there's latency involved, suddenly there's serialization involved, and it really is something different and we need to think about it slightly more differently, but it's a bad idea to do methods that actually go over network. So let's see what ACA does. So ACA does something uh, the opposite way. So locally, in the method land, you would do something like that. And this is line by line, which probably was a bad idea. Yeah, sorry. But there's a few questions you can think about. I'm not going to read all of them. So, for example, the retrying. Suddenly we need to instrument that method somehow to, to make it able to retry. And it's not that trivial to just inject additional logic. And why? However, with messaging, so, the thing ACA does is, it, it is always messaging. Because when you think about it, messaging in a local abstraction is exactly the same semantics-wise as in a distributed abstraction. Because I send the message, it may or may not arrive, because maybe the JVM crashes before the recipient got to the message. And it's also great for concurrent systems because we suddenly, if we send immutable messages around, we don't need to uh, worry about concurrent, ac concurrent access. And especially actors encapsulate mutable state. So both for remote systems and local systems, exactly the same thing can happen, which is where the message could be dropped. There's no 20 failure scenarios with exactly one message loss. So we've simplified the model and basically exposed one, the more restrictive one, the, the messaging one, even though we're locally. So the interesting bit about it is that now it's very simple to introduce like middlemen or processors or proxy or let's say managers that I want to send this guy something and because this is a, well, let's call it a living entity, it can decide, well, okay, I need a worker pool. And it's easy to inject different um, behaviors, depending on what we need, than with plain method calls. Because this guy, if we figure out, whew, now we need to scale out because we have to handle more connections, etc., we just make this guy run on a different node. It is still messaging. So, what do we lose, though? So, obviously, I talked about trade-offs, and messaging is a trade-off as well. Um, so, we lose something that in local and synchronous execution is trivial, right? Stack traces. If you get an exception, you get a stack trace. It's trivial to look who called who, and you just know exactly what happened. So with any kind of messaging or asynchronous uh, execution, I mean, the same thing happens if you just submit things to a thread pool, you lose the stack trace, right? So this is something that uh, is still being worked on, actually. And uh, some people will be pitching uh, Zipkin as the ultimate solution that solves the thing. 
I think that's the beginning of the story and not the end of it. Uh, but I encourage you to look into, if you do any kind of asynchronous systems, have a look at those. And yeah, we're looking into integrating Arco with those as well, actually. But now angry guy on the internet as well. Uh, I can totally do the same with REST calls. Uh, you kind of can. So what's the difference? Well, of course you can, because you can have an HTTP call that returns a, uh, 201, which is created, I believe, or 204, which is no content, right? Uh, yeah, you can. But the thing is, it's a round trip in HTTP, right? You go there, you need a response. OK, nothing, nothing interesting in the response. And then someone needs to go back and call you, and you need to keep an identifier somewhere that this transaction was now handled. So technically, yeah, you can do messaging over HTTP, but practically speaking, it's going to be heavy, and it's not really native. Whereas in actors, well, the actor represents the ID, the, the user, whatever, and it just communicates directly. It, it doesn't have to wait for the response, because if it doesn't get any messages, it uses no uh, threading resource. It, ju it just uses up the amount of memory that it needs to be the actor, which is exactly 40 bytes. So there's a huge difference between doing a heavy low, uh, heavy process thing that calls back and you need to orchestrate everything versus 40 bytes that is exactly what you need to represent a business -y entity with an identifier. So, messages. Uh, another thing about messaging, uh, so someone being new to ACO, um would, for example, write some complex logic and you add some items to your shopping cart and it returns some nicely functional comp complex logic object, so you add to it and you get a new one back. Wonderful. However, oh yeah, for testing we need this getter, right? It happens everywhere. Oh yeah, I just need it for testing. Oh, okay, I see some laughs. Obviously, it is never just for testing. It always creeps into the code base and suddenly you depend on the internal state of the object and you can't test it functionally anymore. So, what happens in ACA? So, because we have the actor ref, which hides the actual, what the actor is, and yes, arguably, would be nicer if it would be typed. We have an experimental module for that, so check it out. But the core idea is y you can't just go in there and rip out the state. It's just syntactically not possible. So you need to implement some kind of protocol. If you really need the state, it should be part of uh, that thing's protocol, right? So suddenly it becomes a behavior that you can test and you can see it instead of this, let's slap on a getter on a thing. So I would say that even though this is harder, it's a good thing that it's harder to get to the state of the thing, right? Okay, last section of the talk is uh, dedicated to Roland Kuhn, who uh, well, kept saying this thing when we were back in the office, that I want my words back. Uh, he specifically meant things like hipster, which uh, turns out it's a thing that um, pu pulls the trousers onto your hips, so it doesn't move, it's not this subculture thing. So um, that's what he meant. But what I mean is um, in a similar vein, but about uh, tech words. So specifically, name collisions causing confusion because everybody uses the same word, but they mean different things. Two examples here, scheduler and stream. Now think about what do you think when you hear scheduler? Okay, you know? Uh, so scheduler usually means, yeah, uh, someone, uh, I, I hear someone said Facebook, so a thing I put in, in a calendar maybe as well. Uh, but usually it's some kind of, at some point in time, something's gonna happen. Right. And that's where the trouble starts. Okay, I want a scheduler. But which one? So, let's say we have an actor. I'm new to ACA, I'm writing this actor thing. Oh, wow, context system scheduler. I have a scheduler, great. And yeah, I just need to count down till the end of the world. 127 days, not much, but let's count. And yeah, I just do that. I schedule once in 127 days a message to myself that, hey, now it's the end of the world and it's time to start screaming. Um, my reaction to that is, no, no, <laughs> just no. Now the question is, who realizes why this is a bad idea? Hands up. Uh, so you 
Yeah, so the uh, answer was you can't schedule things too far in the future, um, which is true. So the thing is, um, w the scheduling in Akka is limited up to, I think, 50 days, which is the range of an int or something like that. Um, but the other problem is, what if the system crashes, right? We crashed, and then the system comes up again, and yeah, we schedule again 127 days. So it, it's not semantically the right thing to do. You shouldn't be scheduling, oh yeah, from now, 127 days, because surely if there's going to be a crash or a system restart or something during that time. So um, before I uh, counter and show you how you should be doing that, let's look at why, um, why the difference. Why can't I do this with the Akka scheduler? So let's go into the dungeon. And by the dungeon, I mean the Akka actor dungeon. So technically, the scheduler isn't in the dungeon, but by the dungeon, we refer to everything in Akka that is the internals. So you shouldn't be really going there. So the Akka scheduler, what is the guarantee that it gives you? It gives you a guarantee that if I say if I run an event here, it actually means no sooner than at this point in time. So it's not a super precise scheduler. It's just no sooner than. But why? Why do we do that? So let's actually go into the implementation. And the implementation is based on a, uh, some, some white papers and actually many people implementing the same thing. And it's called a hashed wheel timer. And what it does is, OK, you have incoming tasks, and they go into buckets. So there's a T4 bucket, T3 bucket, and the wheel keeps turning. And basically, the wheel keeps turning, let's say, every 10 milliseconds. Right? So we do a tick. And then we look at, OK, so which events should have been triggered uh, since the last tick? Right? So this is the preciseness. You can go as precise as fast you can turn the wheel. But turning the wheel super fast is expensive because well, um, you're using up one thread anyway for it. Right? So you have one thread turning the wheel. And then we say, OK, execute everything that is due. And the preciseness is limited by the size of the wheel. So it's a memory trade-off. OK, so you know a bit of the implementation. So what is, the go what is this optimized for? This is optimized for uh, 5 million actors all have some small timeout. Like they have a timeout. If I don't get the response in a second, I will timeout this future. That kind of things. And there's millions of timeouts scheduled all over the place and all the time. So it needs to be really fast and handle a lot of churn in coming and going of events. It's definitely not precise and it's definitely not persistent because these things cost time and we want to be super fast. So this is why you not only can't, but we don't really want to support these things because it's a completely different impl implementation if we would. Uh, here's a funny story that um, sometimes people find, oh yeah, but the net Netty implementation has a hashed wheel scheduler as well. So yeah, the Akka one is based on the Netty one. Then we improved performance of, uh, uh, of the algorithms. Then the Netty guys took it back. And this is what I think is a healthy open source community, that we steal our code. Right? I take the VR scheduler, I improve it, so they steal it back. I think we're um, in a really nice community where sharing and improving code is really encouraged. I find it quite fascinating. So, another fun story. Our implementation is called the LAR, uh, Light Array Revolver Scheduler, uh, LARS for short. And since the talk was titled, uh, The Things You Don't See, this is a thing you don't s probably will never see, which is an exception that says, last cannot start a new thread, ship's going down. Um, basically, if you cannot start a new thread, you're probably screwed anyway, and ship's going down. Uh, if you ever see that exception, I'd be interested in what you have been doing, but probably you're, you're probably going to crash anyway, any minute. So. Uh, what is the actual solution for the end of the world event? The answer is a bit heavier, right? Because we need persistence, we need to store the intent of triggering this event somewhere in the future. So you need persistence. And then you need replication of the actual, um, actual node that will 
act upon the, the scheduled event, right? Because if you have only one node, and now we should be triggering the thing, but this node has so, some GC churn, maybe we should instead spread it out so we can be more precise. So suddenly, such scheduler becomes a big system of its own. Which answers the question, why doesn't Akka, the Akka one do it? We are the high performance one. If you need a persistence one, uh, there's, for example, Kronos or Quartz, right? Okay. So this one's optimized for uh, the long running things. Okay, the second word streams. Okay, so st streaming is um, somehow popular now, I guess. So we've been working on the Arca streams implementation and reactive streams from. 2013, um, and here's a number of other implementations that also use the word stream in the name. Yeah, um, without pointing fingers, uh, just notice that all the things with the I are in the Apache incubate, incubator, so their state is some of them are actually alive, and some of them are not really, really alive. But the problem is, uh, there's like 10 implementations here, but they all do very different things. Right? We talked about the scheduler, there's very different kinds of scheduler, and again, Akka streams would be probably, well, Akka streams is an implementation of reactive streams, as is um, um, Reactor, for example, but the Java streams are, have completely nothing in, in the same, like, even area of design goals. It's completely different. And then some people, have read something about Java streams, right, the parallel collections thing, and they ask, how does that compare to Akka streams? <laughs> well, like the scheduler, one way or the other, right? It's completely different stuff. So, without uh, yammering too much about the differences in the existing implementations, because that's comparing one to another one would be an, an, an entire talk by itself, let's think about what Akka streams are for, right? So, what is TCP? It's a stateful, it's a stateful protocol. What else is it? It's a transport protocol, yes. It's not a control protocol. It's a streaming protocol. It's maybe you're surprised. It actually is. The, the way it uh, controls the flow of data is basically through a windowing mechanism, and that's how streaming protocols work. You can't deliver a, me a just one message using TCP. It's this connection and it has bytes, right? It was, there's a range of bytes delivered. It doesn't talk about one message, right? It's not a message protocol, it's a stream of bytes protocol. So let's think about the RKHTDP case. So RKHTDP is a web server, so from the ground up, built on Akka streams. And if you've been using Spray, um, we basically uh, took the Spray team and worked together on Akka HTTP for the last two years. And Akka HTTP is basically Spray 2.0. So if you've seen the Spray library, uh, this is the next version of it, basically. So what we do is, since here we have a streaming protocol and we have a streaming back pressured implementation in memory, we basically take it all the way through which allows us to, if someone on the receiving end, so let's say I'm on my phone, I'm receiving tweets, and suddenly I go into a tunnel, I can't receive the tweets anymore, then the server doesn't need to write any data because, well, it's still in the uh, kernel buffers, and we don't need to spend the time CPU-wise to generate more tweets for that person because it, that person won't be able to read them anyway until it receives the, the previous ones. So that's something Akka HTTP and Akka Streams are built for. Completely different than, uh, let's say, uh, Apache um, Spark or something like that. That would be data transformation. Completely different again. But everybody used the word stream. So everybody is really confused now. Uh, last topic. Uh, I don't know how long you've been in the Scala community, but um, a few years ago, around 2.9, there was a really uh, call from the community that we need binary compatibility, right? It's, it's a good thing to have, certainly. But Scala is known to break binary compatibility every major version, right? By major version, we mean to 10, to 11, to 12. But uh, sometimes people don't realize that they don't only ask for binary compatibility, 
which is only one, one block. They also ask sometimes for source compatibility and for performance model compatibility, which is if I know that mm, uh, some kind of loop was fast, it still should be fast because that's an assumption I built my system around. So we can't suddenly make something that was fast slow. Or uh, forward compatibility. So I can use, okay, and I need to uh, slowly uh, wrap up. So uh, one example I want to give here is, okay, so people say, uh, to us, uh, the ARCA developers, we need binary compatibility. But it turns out you need more than binary compatibility, you need serialization compatibility because we have this module called ARCA persistence and it's geared towards very long lived objects. So you store the objects in your database and three years from now you should be reading them in and everything should just work. So it turns out because we release across Scala versions and you maybe moved on from 2.10 to 2.11 and which broke uh, serialization compatibility. So this is an interesting thing that, again, no one probably has seen, but we made an explicit effort to read the bytes and figure out from which Scala version something was persisted, and we manually patch the bytes so you can still read, or read in the old Scala objects, even though Scala doesn't guarantee this compatibility, but because we want to help you out, we made it so that it's more compatible than Scala itself in that sense. So things you probably didn't notice but may actually have benefited from. Um, so in terms of magic, wrapping up to the last uh, first, first point I had today, so in terms of magic we prefer to have none of it, so sometimes people ask, why can't we just magically infer something? Um, no, we just don't. That's, that's the answer. The team motto is basically just say no. And if you need a magical framework, we are not it. Um, so folding left, uh, by which I mean summing up. Um, uh, yeah, before we sum up, um, there's, there's one hidden force that maybe people don't see or don't realize why Scala is successful, why, why Arca is successful. But uh, well, actually, it's you. Right, you have a community, so we, we get a lot of contributors and help from the community, bug reports, fixes, and just the fact that we're everyone here and, and can talk to each other about the tech we like. Uh, so thank you. And to sum up uh, the talk that I just gave is basically just keep learning and don't stop reading the book just from the cover. Because on the cover, some libraries may say everything magically works and everything is wonderful. Whereas in our documentation, you will notice we actually go in and explain, yeah, this will break in this and this way, because we're being honest. It's not that the others don't have these problems. It's just they don't really want to tell you. And you, you know, you have a problem on production and then you want to pay them. Then they tell you that, oh yeah, this, this edge case. So, um, we like to be honest. Uh, so thank you very much, um, and if you have any questions, we have a little bit of time for questions. And I'm happy to take uh, questions about anything, like light band, ACA, Scala, whatever. We had a question there. Does it work? I guess it does. Um, I'm asking about uh, Aka HTTP in the experimental namespace. When is that? When is it going to come out of the experimental experimental namespace? Excuse yeah. Me? And why is it still there? Uh, yeah, uh, that's actually a wonderful question. So, um, why is Aka HTTP experimental? So the the reason we call it specifically the ARCA teams call some module experimental means we don't preserve binary compatibility across releases, minor releases even. And the thing is, uh, it doesn't mean that it's not proven or not stable, it is. Um, but sometimes people confuse the experimental label with, oh, we don't know if this works. It, we know it works, it's tested, it's better proven, it's just that we may still need to change a little bit of the API. So, about HTTP specifically, it has a bunch of modules. So, HTTP core, which is the actual server, it's stable right now, uh, since 2.4.2. And the reason HTTP, so the DSL, is not stable right now, 
is basically because it has a lot of directives, around 150 directives, and we want to gather a bunch of feedback before we freeze the API. And I don't anticipate any big changes except one in the marshalling infrastructure, because it's not as lazy as it could be. And that's the only bigger change uh, that might happen to our HTTP. Otherwise, you're, you're free to use it, and performance-wise, we are as fast as Spray or faster on persistent connections, which is uh, you have one connection and multiple request responses on it. Uh, there we're faster, and we are much slower, and we know about it when you open a new connection. Each time you open a new connection, it's really costly right now. Uh, we know exactly why. We just need the time to, to actually address that, and we are currently focused a bit on the new remoting. But, yeah. It will have to be fixed. It's something on the roadmap. So about when, do you, do you know? About when will you uh, when? Um, I'm not sure, actually. When it's done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I would count months and not years, if that helps. <laughs> A question. Um, with the issuing of uh, Legom, Mm -hmm. Is the rest of the ACA stuff, like ACA cluster and everything, uh, going to be put to bed? Or no. Uh, no, no, no. It has nothing to do with it? Uh, that's a great question as well. So what has Lagom to do with ACA in general, and uh, is it killing ACA or whatnot? Um, so the answer is basically, so ACA is a toolkit, right? I said there's many ways to do the same thing. And it's like you get a hammer, you get a thingy, and you just put them together. And Lagom is basically, instead of giving you the choice, it takes away all the choice and says, this is how you do the thing. You don't decide, there's no discussion. Because some people like the framework approach that the tool says, this is the way to do it. So Lagom is basically a thin, thin layer on top of Akka and Akka persistence and uh, some of the clustering as well. Uh, that just prescribes some of the ways to do stuff. If you, for example, are not that experienced with ACA and you don't want to, perhaps you don't want to learn it, we, we have customers who are like, oh my god, this is so complex, um, then they want to use Lagom instead. But on the other hand, it's not like we don't have people who really love uh, the, the t toolkit style of ACA. So it's not impacting. Um, it's, it's like Lagom is using the building blocks we provide. One more? Very in the. Yeah. Wonderful question. Yeah, I will repeat the question. The question was uh, what are the tools I can recommend to measure performance? Because I said, yeah, measure everything, and I didn't give any uh, names. Uh, there are actually good names. Um, so, uh, it depends on the granularity. So if you want uh, small benchmarks, for example, um, you want to... Um, it, it's best for synchronous code, but, but for async it works as well. So for micro benchmarks, there's JMH. Uh, that's uh, developed by the Oracle um, OpenJDK team, their performance team specifically. And it's a tool that takes care of, because in Java, um, performance is not predictable unless the JVM warms up. Right? It needs to just in time compile your code and optimize it a little bit, and then it stabilizes. So JMH is a tool that takes care of uh, warming, warming up the JVM and actually measuring the right thing. So if you just do a loop and measure time around it, it's probably going to report wrong stuff. So that's for micro benchmarks. For uh, benchmarks about uh, HTTP, for example, you want to measure um, latency. Uh, the tricky thing is, um, there is a known problem in many tools, like uh, Apache Benchmark suffers from it, um, and yeah, many others as well, which is called coordinated omission, which is the benchmarking tool is implicitly slowed down and back pressured by just the nature of the TCP protocol, and the, the, the numbers it reports are biased. Usually they look better than they are really. So uh, there is a uh, WRK2 uh, library, and the interesting bit is, oh, so, okay, so there is WRK, but there is a, this two version is fixed by Giltene, and it avoids this problem by um, 
if it notes it's being slowed down, it adds that time to the measurement. So it's more honest about the actual latencies. So that's about the just, measure, just measuring throughput and latency, W or K. And if you want to measure a, the grand scheme of things, like um, my website and how long does it take to go through this um, weird steps. And also it does, um, let's say I have a front thousand users and they are ramping up slowly and then they stay a bit and or we have like fluctuating number of users. Uh, for that I like Gatling a lot. Uh, it's just built on Scala and Akka actually, but it's really scriptable. Uh, so you can do stories like that, what happens when I get so many users, etc. So Gatling is nice for that. Um, and those are the three we use, and I'd recommend to start out with. And then you go into however deep you want to go. If you want to go just a bit of profiling, uh, then your kit or uh, J-Profiler. Okay, yeah. So I'm happy to chat on the corridor. So thank you very much. I hope this was fun and enjoy the conference.